<clears throat> Good morning. Today is, oh, thank you for joining me for my daily Come Follow Me study of the Book of Mormon. Today is Monday the 18th, and we're going to start with the daily reflection on the New Tet Book of Mormon. Okay. If ye shall say there is no law, ye shall also say there is no sin. If ye shall say there is no sin, ye shall also say there is no righteousness. And if these things are not, there is no God. Second Nephi chapter 2 verse 13. The Father's gracious plan of happiness grants... You okay, honey? Grants us capacity to choose, but for agency to operate, there must be law, knowledge, and choices. Without opposition, without agency, moral life, mortal life would be without meaning or purpose. Laws are essential to learning and progress. Good could not be defined without evil. Any philosophy that tries to free us from guilt by teaching there is no law, no sin, and no unrighteousness leads directly to an argument for the non-existence of God. It is an approach as old as time, as deadly as ever, and it will always promote, and it is always promoted by the father of lies. Um, if God allows us to choose life or death, happiness or misery, he will not force us to be good and the devil cannot compel us to do evil each day we decide to follow god's plan and his laws walking in the way of happiness and eternal life you okay honey mm -hmm. okay are you gonna go upstairs yeah. all right okay Okay, honey. All right. So, um, we're at Second Nephi chapter thirty-one. Um, I think we're we are we are wrapping up Second Nephi, and beginning of April we're gonna start Jacob. Um, but anyways, Second Nephi chapter thirty-one. Nephi tells why Christ was baptized. He's wrapping up his prophesying, um, and just, uh, uh, basically, what is it, the fourth article of faith? I never memorize those. But anyways, faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, enduring to the end, that's basically this chapter. There was a lot I could have chosen for my hu or my humility verse, um, but I chose verse 5. And now if the Lamb of God, he being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to, to fulfill all righteousness, oh then, how much more need have we, being unholy, to be baptized, yea, even by water. So, um, this to me, what I wrote was, Jesus was humble enough to follow every commandment, even though it might not see even though it might not make sense, uh, will I humbly follow? So that's what I wrote in my scriptures. Um, the, the argument that he's holy, he, he's never made a mistake. Why would he need to be baptized? Because it's part of the plan. And if he was, even though he didn't need baptism, he still submitted to the Father's will. And was baptized. Um, let's get into our commentary. Okay. Um, <sighs> the doctrine of Christ shall speak unto you plainly. Nephi gives an inspired formulation of the doctrine of Christ, embracing the first four principles and ordinances of the gospel. 
Thereafter, one must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having hope and the love of God and of all men. Here we are to feast upon the word of God and endure to the end to receive eternal life. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland points out that the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ has to do with these first principles and ordinances. In a marvelous final testimony to his people, as well as to the unborn and unseen of the last dispensation yet to come, Nephi made an end of his prophesying, including prophesying about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and included his writing and his lifetime of teaching with a few words concerning the doctrine of Christ. Although a phrase like the doctrine of Christ could <clears throat> appropriately be used to describe any or all of the master's teachings, nevertheless, those magnificently broad and beautiful expressions spread throughout the Book of Mormon, New Testament, and Latter-day Scriptures might more properly be called the doctrines of Christ. Note that the phrase Nephi used to distinctly sing is distinctly singular. In Nephi's concluding testimony, and later in the Savior's own declaration to the Nephites at his appearance to them, the emphasis is on a precise, precise focus, singular sense of Christ's doctrine, specifically that which the prophet Joseph Smith declared to be the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Yep, it was on Articles of Faith number four. <clears throat> The doctrine of Christ, as taught by Nephi in his grand uh, summational discourse, focuses on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism by immersion, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. It does not, in this declaration, attempt to cover the entire plan of salvation, all the virtues of a Christian life, or the rewards that await us in differing degrees of heavenly glory. It does not, in this declaration, deal with the offices of the priesthood, the ordinances of the temple, or many other true doctrines. All these are important, but as used in the Book of Mormon, the doctrine of Christ is simple and direct. It focuses on the first principles of the gospel <clears throat> exclusively, including an expression of encouragement to endure, to persist, to press on. Indeed, it is in the clarity and simplicity of the doctrine of Christ that its impact is found. Nephi knew he would Nephi knew it would be so. He wrote, I shall speak unto you plainly according to the plainness of my prophesying. Goodness me. Holy cow. She's a wheeze. Lots for 31. We're not going to cover it all. Um, okay, one more. The only true, the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God. The doctrine of Christ is, in effect, the doctrine of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We recognize that the Godhead consists of three distinct beings, as noted in the scriptures. Nevertheless, they are one God. Oneness has many definitions, but when used in the scriptures by the Lord in reference to the oneness of the Godhead, it refers to unity of mission, being of one accord and purpose. And just as the Lord prayed for his disciples to be one as he and his father are one. Another example is the occasion when the Apostle Paul speaks of husband and wife being one flesh the multitude is described as being of one heart and one soul. We are one in the Lord. We are told to be one with the Lord as he is one with the Father. We are commanded to be one, else we are not considered to be the Lord's. The Lord states that we are one in unity with him and our Father in heaven. The doctrine of unity and oneness is the opposite of division and contention which is fostered by the father of contention. Which kind of goes along with the Relief Society um, broadcast last night. Being one group and, you know, one sisterhood and serving each other and gathering Israel and 
It was good. Okay, let's end this Come Follow Me portion of the video with a daily reading on prayer. Oh, my back. Okay. Today is Day 78. This one is by Dwan J. Young. Expressing gratitude in prayer brings blessings. Most of the time we think of prayer only when we want something, but when we start by expressing gratitude for the things we already have, we begin to see our lives in a new way. I experience this as the primary general president. My calling is to care not only for the children in our church, but for the children in all of the world. This is a tremendous responsibility, and at first, I could feel only the burden of it, but I seek for the Lord's help constantly. Then, just the other morning, I thought, I have been asking for so much. This morning, I am not going to ask for one thing. I am just going to be grateful. I knelt and thanked the Lord for my good health, for my understanding husband, for our children, for our missionary son, for the privilege of serving, for the board members and staff who assist me, for stake and ward members throughout the world who are serving, and especially for the teachers who give <clears throat> and care so much. I thanked him for the children everywhere. I thanked him for the prophet, and the list went on. My spirit soared. What an astounding experience to know that I have so much. It takes a grateful heart to experience that soaring, that realization of how much Heavenly Father loves you, how much he does for you. Okay. Moving on to the General Conference Challenge portion. Uh, today's Monday, so there's nothing on the docket. And I'm not reading the book because we're flying out tomorrow. Now, there's there's nothing in the general conference portion of this video, but we're going to talk about my trip, okay? Why? Because I want to, and two, I got to let you in on some things of how it will be. Um, so the flight leaves at 520 tomorrow, and you're supposed to be at the airport two hours prior to departure, before, not departure, boarding. Um, so we have to be at the airport at like 3.30 thereabouts. My sister does not want to drive us at 2.30 in the morning. She does not want to wake up at 2.30 in the morning to drive us to the airport. So there is talk of us going tonight. Like at around 10, 10.30, she's going to drive us to the airport, drop us off. We're going to spend the night in the airport and then uh, take off in the morning. <clears throat> now that's all fine and dandy. When am I going to do the video for tomorrow? One, I can do it after work, uh, before we leave for the airport. I can do that. I can also do it at like three in the morning at the airport. I could do that. Um, but we'll see what I have time for. I have lost my neck pillow. Alex likes to play with it and I don't know where it is. Um, so there's that. We might have to go to the store. Um, so I could be doing it tomorrow after, I mean, today after work, there's no more tomorrow. It's today, um, today after work or in the morning at the airport, which I think might be a little bit interesting to see how it's going to work traveling, but we can do it. Um, and then also I might not comment on all of the videos on all of the comments that you guys post, which I know your understanding of that, but just, you know, you know, I'm on vacation and I know you're not going to expect anything from me, but I might just like not comment. I'm on vacation. So we'll see how it goes. I'm going to play it by ear. I'm not trying to plan every single detail. I was so nervous yesterday. So freaking nervous. I've got our boarding passes and, and it's less than 24 hours before we go. So tomorrow at this time, we will be on a plane towards Dallas. So that's all the fun stuff. Yes. As you can see, I did schedule myself to work today. Why? Cause I'm crazy. And if I stayed at home 
fussing all day, I probably would have thrown up. But anyways, going to work today, going to print out the boarding passes, so on and so forth. I'm all packed, and now I just have to charge everything, work, shower, figure out some kind of breakfast. Anyways, that's all. Let's end this video with a read it, do it. It is the 18th. Second Nephi chapter 31 verses 1 through 9, they highlight verse 3, God speaks to men according to their language, unto their understanding. Take note of how God speaks to you. That's a good one. I don't mind that one so much. Okay. I've got all my stuff together for videos. All the books are ready to go. I'm not hauling the books. I've got pictures, so on and so forth. So we are good to go. Let's go on vacation. All right. That was Second Nephi chapter 31. And tomorrow we do a general conference talk. Uh, Ponder the Path of Thy Feet by Thomas S. Monson, 2014. Okay. We will see you sometime tomorrow. Bye.